Ladies and gentlemen, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, George Freeman. Um, George is the uh, Minister for Life Sciences, a Parliamentary Under Secretary of State at the Department of Health and the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. And his mission uh, is to make the UK the best place uh, in the world to discover and develop 21st century healthcare innovations. So no real challenge there, I suppose. Uh, he is uh, clearly a, a key player in, in the development of our healthcare systems, and the, of which he has, of course, practical experience. Uh, George was elected to Parliament in 2010 after a 15-year uh, career across the life sciences sector, in particular working with hospitals, clinical researchers, patient groups, and biomedical research companies to pioneer novel healthcare uh, innovations. Uh, the minister has agreed to speak to us for about 18 minutes or so uh, with, with our typical precision. Uh, and there will be time at the end of that for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, George Freeman. Thank you. Thank you. Kind. Well, Lord Chalky, um, AMRC guests, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, we do a lot of precision medicine in this sector. I shall try and do precision speaking and come in at 17 and a half minutes. Um, I wanted to be here today, um, not just on the sort of routine ministerial speaking circuit, but I really wanted to come today and support what you're doing and say something about why I think this landscape is becoming so exciting and particularly so exciting for charities and the growing role for the medical research charity sector and indeed for the AMRC as its voice in the new landscape that we're creating. And I, um, in the course of my work, the, that which isn't public uh, and on Twitter, um, Ashling and Louise and the team uh, and I are building a strong dialogue around that role uh, for the charities and I want to say something about where I think that might go. But it's also a chance to uh, applaud, congratulate, champion, showcase and support the extraordinary work that our medical research charity sector does from uh, the big, um, from CRUK, which has led in so many areas, but right down through the pyramid to some of the really small specialist uh, uh, charities, often working with very part-time voluntary, some no uh, proper admin support, doing an extraordinary job in advocating for their patients, raising money, funding research. And in case either the fire alarm goes or I collapse to the floor clutching my chest, I, in all my meetings in the department, I insist on the fire alarm test. What's the point if we had to evacuate in two minutes? Here's my central message, that in the, this new landscape of uh, um, increasingly targeted medicines, genomic and informatic technologies, transforming the way drugs can be developed, the way devices and diagnostics and different technologies begin to merge. I think it's changing the research landscape uh, so that uh, research starts with and runs through and with patients much more than it used to. When I came into this sector, it was very siloed. Deep science for tomorrow in academic labs, spin-outs if you're lucky, funded if they were lucky, uh, working with pharma if they were lucky, through a very long development process if everyone was lucky, through NICE and NHS England, eventually to the oh-so-patient patient, patient waiting at the end for that treatment. It's too long for the patients, it's too long for industry, and it's too long for all of us. And in this new landscape, something very exciting becomes possible to target innovations much more quickly to the patients who increasingly we know through genomics and biomarkers will benefit. It de-risks the pathway, but much more importantly, it puts patients at the heart of the whole process. And increasingly, what industry wants is to be able to work with patients, with their tissues, with their data, with their clinicians, with real people, with real disease, in real time, in real places. Our over-dependence on computer models and uh, laboratory mice and rats, we will always have to depend on animal models, don't get me wrong, but our over-dependence has not served the industry well in coming up with drugs that work well in real patients with real disease and the complex comorbidities of an aging society. And that means that the patient's uh, assets go right to the centre stage of the new landscape, and that in turn means that the patient voice will have to go rightly centre stage. And I think that is challenging in all sorts of ways. The ethical regulatory questions are challenging, but no country tackles them better than this country with the values of the NHS and the expertise of the NHRA and NHS England. But I think that change creates a huge opportunity for patients and for the charities who advocate for them. 
And I see the charity sector acknowledging and adapting to that change. I hear more and more charities saying to me, we used to be tin rattlers on the high street. This country, by the way, raises more money for medical research per head than any other nation on earth. We do animals uh, and we do medical research better than anyone. A lot of charities say to me, we used to rattle tins, raise money, fund as much research as we could, but we didn't feel we were making a big enough difference. A number have said to me, we now raise, and they've put two noughts on the end, uh, huge increases in the amount they're raising from philanthropic, not-for-profit, uh, not and from their own patients. We fund research more strategically. We lead in research, uh, 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 research committees and research guidance. We advocate on research protocols. We build treatment models with and for our patients, and we build a patient community online so that our patients have a stronger voice. And in coming together online, that also supports research using data uh, and the collective use of those assets. And I think that is an incredibly exciting opportunity for the charities. And I want to say today that part of my mission is to bring some new voices to the top table. It's not just Big Pharma. They have a key role to play, but it's also med tech, device, diagnostic, digital, and the, the medical research charities. And I've said to Ashling and the team, uh, I want the AMRC and this sector to come to top table and to take a stronger voice in that sector. So let me just say something about uh, the mission uh, that you were kind enough to summarize. It, it is slightly daunting, but I have to tell you, it completely inspires me every morning and evening. I consider myself the luckiest minister in government, not just because there's a lot of good news coming from this sector. Jeremy Hunt calls me his minister for good news. Um, it's not all good news, and when I sit at night signing letters from industry complaining that we're too slow to get innovations to patients and that they're going to leave Britain if we don't tackle it, and then I switch and sign letters from patients and charities telling me we're too slow to get innovation in to patients. Um, there is bad news. And I'm, when I sign letters saying, I'm sorry that NHS England haven't been able to afford this drug, I'm sorry that uh, the process has said no at this point, um, there, are, there is bad news as well. So I'm driven by both the opportunity and the challenge. And when the Prime Minister set out our mission in the 2011 life science strategy, there were some very important things in there which drive me on. We said at the time that we wanted to change the definition of life sciences from biopharma, uh, industry, and uh, pure academic research, which we've supported well and led the world in the 20th century, to a broader definition of the science of life and science in healthcare, and to unleash a second cylinder, not just supporting the Department of Business with important ring fence protection for science and the catapult centers and grants and skills, and supporting industry, but unleashing the power of the NHS as a second cylinder, pumping in t tissues, genomic leadership, data, access to clinical trials infrastructure, uh, and crucially pulling through as a cylinder on the upstroke innovation more quickly into both assessment and into practice. And at the heart of it was, uh, I remember us writing the paragraph, a reminder that at its core, the NHS was, is, and should always be a research organization. If one goes back to that early thinking, uh, the early reports around beverage in the war that led up to the thinking of the creation of the service, it's quite an interesting thing to do, by the way. It was a more local service. It was a more patient-driven service. It was a more preventative service. And it was fundamentally a research service. And we said in that speech, we want every hospital to be a research hospital, every patient to be a research patient, by which we mean a more intelligent health system that uses the footprint of diagnosis and of treatment day in, day out uh, to support smarter treatment, precision medicine, better diagnostics, and better care. Uh, and that is why I'm really privileged to be not just the Minister for the Drugs Budget and CDF, NICE and MHRA, and now all the digital health, but also for the NIHR, that billion pound a year platform for clinical research that underpins the NHS. And a big part of my mission is to bring the research base, clinical practice, uh, uh, NICE, uh, NHS England together and create a, a space in which we can be more intelligent and use that research data, not just from clinical trials, not even just from medical research, but in a new field of what I'd call research medicine, medicine that is intelligent all the time, gathering data on responses and feeding that back into more intelligent treatment and allowing that to inform a 21st century NICE, which has greater flexibilities uh, than just simply a binary go, no go on one uh, on one quality, we need to recognize that the range of treatments coming is going to require a range of different pathways. I want to say something particularly about the NIHR, which I think is a, if not the jewel in the crown of our life science landscape. 
uh, don't get me wrong, the MRC's £750 million medical research uh, budget and platform and infrastructure is crucial. Uh, but in this new landscape of clinical, translational, patient-centred medicine, I think that extraordinary legacy of a nationwide platform is absolutely crucial. And I'm very proud to be the minister for the NIHR. I'm proud that we've managed to continue to fund it. Uh, I was in Massachusetts recently, and the governor proudly told me that he's the life science governor. He builds a whole electoral campaign on life sciences, which gives me some hope. Um, Massachusetts' whole economic development strategy, social strategy built on life sciences, health and wealth, opportunity, clean, green, resilient, modern living. And he told me proudly they put a billion dollars into a 10-year fund to support life sciences. I told him we spend a billion pounds every year on the NIHR. You know, we forget sometimes that we are a superpower in this field and we should uh, project it and uh, lead appropriately. So alongside the billion in the NIHR, uh, the uh, medical research charities raise 436 million pounds every year. That is a phenomenal achievement. That makes you, in my book, a, if not a big, f big farmer, then certainly a major player in this field. And I think we need to treat the medical research se sector in that way. And I just pay tribute to Sally Davis and the team at the NIHR for what they've done and the consistent drive to uh, develop that infrastructure. Uh, 120 million pounds of industry uh, funding coming in this year. 99% of hospitals now doing research. 752 active studies across the NHS. We're trying to drive down the, uh, uh, the, the time to recruit patients. We've got an 80% reduction in the time to get permissions and we've now got it down to an average of 20 days. And we're setting more ambitious targets to drive on. Uh, and the HRA single approval process, gritty stuff. Uh, people don't talk about it down the dog and duck, but we know it's crucial to getting this landscape uh, working. And I want to pay tribute to CRUK as well, who I think have pioneered and led in this field. I went recently as a sign of the times. Again, I went deliberately to tell this story and to highlight the message to the opening of the CRUK MedImmune AstraZeneca combined laboratory in Cambridge. That's a medical research charity, not just funding research, not just rattling the tin and giving the money to fund research, but a combined laboratory, CRUK scientists embedded with big pharma scientists, CRUK on the research committee setting the priorities. That is a really exciting sign, I think, of what's to come, much greater collaboration between charities and industry. And I really want to applaud the joint AMRC-NIHR workshop, which is leading on shaping some of the thinking about where we go next. I've uh, agreed, suggested to Sally that next year we should have an NIHR Parliament Day to tell the story of this great landscape. And in the room, I'd like to have stands from the charities and bring together a, a much bigger dialogue about how the NIHR mothership, if you like, uh, supports a lot of research charities and important research around it. And I suspect there are opportunities for charities to see what NIHR is already doing, to use their money uh, to complement, to avoid any duplication, and to get more value and more leverage out of that extraordinary combination of public and voluntary research. I want to say something about uh, the uh, role of NHS England in this. Um, central to that mission uh, is to try and, whilst recognising the pressure on NHS England, uh, of all our great uh, and inspired public service leadership teams, Simon Stevens and his team have a big challenge on their hands. They've set out to us very clearly the scale of the transformation, the digitalization, the care pathway transformation, the integration with care that the NHS has got to go through. It is a stunning uh, and extraordinarily challenging task over the next five years. But one that they and NHS leadership are up for, we've put the money in and we're doing everything we can to support them to achieve it. Uh, and at the heart of that will be a faster embracing of transformational technologies, digitalization, smart devices, smart diagnostics, moving away from a paradigm where we tend to diagnose late, treat late, and allow the chronic disease burden to fill our hospitals. We need to get better at diagnosing earlier, treating smarter, preventing. And that, again, is all about patient empowerment. And when I went to see the Formula One telemetry wireless smart uh, monitoring technology that we're pioneering in the pediatric cardiac unit at Birmingham, Potentially, that technology could and should be used to allow patients currently in hospital to be at home with loved ones in their families, providing 24-7 data feed on a personalized algorithm so that the alarm goes in the GP or in the hospital when it needs to go and that staff aren't required uh, 
to waste time monitoring and uh, holding people in hospital who, aren't, uh, who don't require to be. And that, again, is an opportunity for patient empowerment and, I think, an opportunity for charities to have some say and some, some role in how that monitoring and how that uh, activity could and should work. And NHS England uh, are embracing these transformational technologies to drive the transformation. And I think that is, again, an opportunity and more a demand. It will require stronger patient voice. Uh, we're working on a whole lot of things together. I'm not going to run through them all in detail with you. But I wanted to highlight particularly the importance of research in the five-year forward view and the importance of this harnessing of the intelligence in the system and the intelligence and the research through the NIHR to drive uh, uh, more precision, smarter, more accurate medicine. I wanted to flag the 10K genome project, which, a 100K genome project, which um, when we set it out, the Prime Minister gave the speech. I think some people thought it was a sort of Kennedy moonshot. Uh, we're going to be the first nation on earth to sequence 100,000 full genomes, not just the SNPs, the full genomes, and combine it with the phenotypic data and create a database. And uh, it's a reference library, not a lending library. We're not going to sell anyone's genomes. We're not going to sell anybody's patient data. But we're going to build, and we are building, a secure database. And we want everyone with an interest in 21st century genomic medicine to come and work with it. Industry are coming and paying. And I'm going to make sure that any revenues we raise, cost recovery and legitimate uh, uh, reimbursement for the sunk cost in that are ring-fenced and go into uh, the NHS to support our growth in genomic medicine. But it's also a huge resource for charities to use, uh, and I want to make sure that charities are able to use it, that the interfaces are appropriate, and the protocols too. I went to see recently, Genomics England showed me the first uh, bit of work they've done on discovering a new diagnostic and treatment for a rare disease. And it was stunning, stunning stuff to see. Big computer power uh, thrown at remash, rehashed, remashed DNA, and they identified as a particular rare disease, a blindness in children that leads to uh, very, sh uh, very much shortened life expectancy. One of the volunteers on the program has it. He wants his children not to suffer. They identified five genetic variations, knocked out four as not being related, identified the fifth, realized it was implicated in an existing eye disease pathway for which there's a drug. It's a generic. It costs pence. It's on the market. And they decided with the patient and clinician consent to try it. And guess what? It uh, arrests the onset of the disease. That's a stunning, low-cost, repurposed, uh, off-label medicine use driven by genomics and computing power. And I think it speaks to the potential for that program, not just to unlock the deep science of new cures and new drugs for tomorrow, but to support smarter diagnostics and quicker treatments for rare disease patients, many of whom rely on charities in this organization. So I think that the Genomics Project is a phenomenal opportunity for this broader revolution as well. And I wanted to flag two other things that NHS England are doing, which I think are incredibly powerful and provide opportunities for this sector. Our test bed program, which Simon Stevens and I have put together to try and unlock the power of uh, intermediate, uh, mid-scale organizations in the NHS. There are fabulous pioneers down in the laboratories or in individual wards or hospitals. And there are people in Whitehall, in my office and in his, pulling levers, trying to encourage innovative medicine. In my view, not least from my experience before coming to Parliament, where things really start to happen at scale with impact uh, is in those intermediate scales where you have one to two million patients, where you can get the hospital, GP, CCG, social care, local government leaders around one table. Um, there are not 150 people, there are 20 or 30 people. Uh, if they all come from a similar area, there's half a chance their children will be at school together. There's a sense of place. And if you've got an inspired clinical scientist who controls clinical resource, the beds, the treatment pathway, and research, then you can start to really integrate research medicine and change pathways and use them to attract investment into new treatments. And that creates a huge opportunity for patient voice and charities again. And that test bed program is about offering five to ten geographies in the NHS with strong leadership, good digital infrastructure to measure and good uh, opportunities to change particular care pathways in groundbreaking combinations of uh, technology companies providing technology and uh, clinicians and care pathway leaders innovating. And I hope to see a strong voice for uh, charities and patients in that as well. And finally, underpinning all of that, um, you know as well as I know that uh, we will not achieve a 21st century NHS 
this revolution of more precision, targeted, faster, smarter treatments without data. It is the oil that flows through a modern health service. And uh, I don't think we've been clear enough with people about it, uh, about why we need data to flow for individual care, for system performance and safety, and for research. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I clutch my chest and go down, I want the paramedic to come not with a pad and a biro, but with an iPad and my uh, history, my uh, blood group, uh, any allergies, uh, my basic patient records. I want the frontline clinician to have it. And when they've treated me, to hit a, hit a button and it goes straight onto my electronic health record, my GP to know, the consultant to know, and when I get to the hospital, they know. Uh, and I don't think it's complicated. I think just about every other walk of life does it, and patients should expect it, and charities should expect it on behalf of their patients. And for treatment and safety, uh, we absolutely need to integrate patient records across primary, secondary, and community care. And for research, we all know well the power of both deep individual phenotypic uh, uh, data and those anonymous cohort data. And we need to tell the story to the public and to patients. Um, I will do all my, uh, my absolute best, but I can assure you I'm probably the worst person um, uh, to go and convince people of the importance of it and of the importance of doing it. You are the best people. The charities, the not-for-profit people who have at their heart one sole goal, which is to improve care for their patients. The clinicians uh, uh, and the patients themselves are the best people. So I, my ask to you is please, in the debate about data, speak loudly and tell people uh, what needs to happen. Uh, we can't run an NHS on cardboard and paper uh, if we're going to really deliver modern healthcare. I'm probably over my 18 minutes. I'm going to wrap up and say uh, just this, really, that... Uh, I hope you can see in what we've done in the last few years in government that there's a commitment. It comes right from the top. The Prime Minister personally uh, drives this agenda and gives me huge support. And I hope you can see the Chancellor equally in what we've tried to do in a difficult funding round to ring fence science, capital and revenue, to continue the, the catapult centres for precision medicine and cell therapy, uh, to continue the support for innovative research, to ring fence the NHS, to support, continue funding the NIHR <laughs> properly, uh, and to drive these uh, innovations, to get innovation more quickly into the system, and to back and fund the five-year forward view that we are committed to this joined-up landscape. Uh, and I just close by saying that I genuinely believe there is a, 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 a generational change, a real opportunity for the charity sector to speak, and my door is open, and for as long as I'm in this office, uh, I hope one of my legacies will be to change that discussion so it's not just big government, big industry talking about big drugs and big price deals, but we have a more flexible, faster landscape, and that is what my Accelerated Access Review is really all about. I'm not going to talk about it, although I love talking about it, because I know you're talking about it this afternoon. But please hear me, it's not just about big drugs, it's about digital diagnostics, devices, and it's about the little, the small. And I'm hoping we build a landscape where you, the charities, will come to me and say, Minister, We've got together with our patients, we've pooled our data, we have a research pool, portal, we've raised money philanthropically, we've got a bond with some city financiers, we're going to get this going on a not-for-profit, we've got an innovation, we want to uh, bring it through your new lit runway faster for patient benefit. And if you look at what people like Cure Leukemia and Charlie Craddock are doing in Birmingham, what they're doing in Belfast, transforming outcomes, bringing money into the local economy, improving health of their populations, I think we've got a really exciting future and you are absolutely fundamental to it. So thank you for all that you do. Any questions? Yeah. Can you take it? yeah, happy. I, I went into detail on the CSR. Uh, the, the Minister has said that uh, he, he would be happy to answer a few questions, but not detail on the CSR, which I think <laughs> is a reasonable uh, precaution. Uh, could, I, could I ask um, for the first question? Yes. Uh, um, I'm uh, Robert Welsh uh, here on behalf of the Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke. It was interesting to hear you mention Belfast in the last sentence there. I was going to ask, how does the, do the existence of the devolved administrations impact on the very bright future that you've uh, painted for us? And obviously I'm particularly interested in the Northern Ireland situation, but there obviously are other uh, parts of the UK, I believe. <laughs> well, I'm really glad you asked me that. I'm, I am actually the UK Minister for Life Science. Um, in a government committed to uh, a one-nation program in which the different bits of the United Kingdom
gain more devolution and more voice and more, more autonomy within a stronger UK. And I'm also absolutely committed to ensure that this sector isn't just um, powerful and important in Cambridge, um, in Oxford and in London, which is why over the last year I've been to Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and I've been to the outposts of the Life Sciences Kingdom. I've been to Milton Keynes and Swindon and Reading and all sorts of places that didn't know they were 21st century clusters of life science, but they do now. Um, I would just mention Belfast. I mean, it's a stunning example. And to your point, what impressed me was uh, when I got there, and I didn't want to go and tell Belfast or Scotland or Wales, it wouldn't be for me to tell them what to do. It's important that there's local leadership, very important. But what struck me and what I was stunned by was that Belfast said, Minister, we've taken the life science strategy that you set out and we've localized it and we're doing it here in Northern Ireland and we want to show you what we're doing. And they were indeed doing it with stunning benefits, actually. And if you look at what Belfast has done on cancer, uh, deep science, uh, you know, nature papers and really brilliant science, but because it's in a translational model, it's changing care pathways, leading to uh, Northern Ireland going from quite low in the cancer outcomes league table to quite high, and it's pulled money in to the local economy. So uh, it's another chance to applaud the work that's going on. And one of my messages to MRC and to well, NIHR don't need to hear it because they've already got that in their DNA. But we need to make sure we're not funding the convenient silos of um, excellence uh, without just asking, are there emerging centres of excellence that require some support uh, as well? I think it's a really important message. And I did go to Scotland last year to highlight the Scottish cluster. Extraordinary work. I worked in Scotland for three years helping to set up the Translational Medicine Research Collaboration between the four universities and hospitals. And the work they've done, as ever, the Scots sometimes ahead of us uh, on data and on integration and on linking the hospitals and the universities uh, to implore them to recognize that they are stronger in the United Kingdom, uh, not least because I would find it difficult, Joe Johnson and I and the Chancellor would find it difficult to continue spending half a billion every year on medical research in a foreign country. Uh, but there's a more important point, which is actually through the insights that we could learn in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales. They are insights that through a common commitment to the NHS values of health for all, uh, we actually should be able to improve the outcomes for everybody. Could I have the, uh, yes. Good morning, James Pickett from the outside Mr. Science. Thank you for an inspiring um, talk. I just wanted to talk more about the bureaucracy that's still with clinical trials at the moment. And I uh, acknowledge that there's a lot of improvement in this area. But in particular, a lot still remains to be done, I feel, and particularly around setting up multi-center science studies. And when we may get one site open, there's still very long delays when we need kind of these national sites. So I just welcome your thoughts on what may be, uh, what may be in the pipeline and still to address around some of the getting trials set up and started quicker. Well, it's a, it's a good point well made. That's why I touched on it in my remarks. It's, it's one of those issues that um, uh, you know, we have to just keep at it. Um, I think we've made some big improvements. Um, Sally uh, and I are constantly looking at what can we do to uh, help to speed it up, uh, as is the OSCAR, the Office for Strategic Coordination of Health Research, uh, chaired by John Bell. Um, so we're, we're all on it. I mean, I would extend the invitation today and following today. If there's a shopping list of things that need to go faster, that we need to do better or stop doing, please um, do feel free to submit it to me and I'll happily raise it with all the various organizations. It, it may be something we might want to raise through and after the NIHR day as well. I'm in your hands, but the door is open for any suggestions. I, I, we have time for one short question. One very short question. Well, if there isn't a very short question, I'd like to say I think on behalf of all of us, thank you very much indeed, Minister, for an inspiring speech. And we're very glad you came to talk to us this morning. Thank you. Thanks very much.